video rather old and faded so don't try to adjust your set during the program just sit back in your armchairs and we'll take a little trip in time back to the portwood of the past hold on to your chairs and we're off Blackpool had its famous landmark with the Blackpool Tower. Port 2 had its own tower and that could be seen from miles around. We're looking now at the top of the mill gate outside the church, that's the St Mary Church. And we can see the tower there and we're going to go down the hill into the bottom of mill gate. Just down the bottom of Mill Gate was the County Hotel. And we'll pass the county and we'll turn round the corner there. Turn left round the corner. So we've turned the corner round the pub and we're into what was called Sharkross Pole. If we look to the end of the picture at the left, you can just see the edge of the, the corn merchant's house and the building on the left hand side, I think part of it was once a slaughterhouse. And that was in Shawcross Fold. We come out of Chalkers Fold and we're halfway down the hill from the market, Park Street, and the pub on the corner was the Rope and Anchor. I think it led to be, came to be Boyle's Cafe. And just down from the pub was Mrs. Binks's fish and chip shop. And of course right at the bottom of the hill and you can not quite see it of course, but the bottom was Park Street Pie Shop. So this is an old picture of the Rope and Anchor pub. Another approach down to Port was Turner Street from the market to Andrew Square and the Park Chambers on the right and if anyone can remember halfway down the hill on the left was a locksmith shop and you could watch him working in the front room of the house in the window. He always seemed to wear a waistcoat and a ball of hat while he was working. Here we can see the cooling town again in the distance and this was the main approach to Portwood from the town along Warren Street with the Warren Buckley pub on the right and in the distance was the Vernon Arms and the shops on the left the end one furthest away from us of course was Brady's showrooms and auctioneers This site on the left, much earlier, was part of the mills complex of Park Mills. As I say, just to the left on Warren Street, behind the shop was Park Mills. This is about where Sainbridge Car Park is now. It was originally a silk mill, and it changed over to cotton in 1851. The mill on the site before that, the very first mills, were water driven and you can still see the archways in the basement where the water was discharged back into the river from the tunnels. 
and the park mill itself, there was a terrible fire and explosion in March 1851, and 20, 22 people were killed in the fire, well, 20 in the fire, and two people were killed, drowned, jumping in the river to try to escape. Looking now, we're looking at Andrew Square. Now Andrew Square was named after William Andrew, who was the last of the town's manorial mayors in 1834. The Dolphin Mill is on the right of the picture, and the bus shelter on the left was originally an air aid shelter in World War II. The telephone box there was one of only two telephone boxes imported, two public boxes doing very short supply. We'll have another word about telephone boxes later on. Just underneath the poster on the shops in the distance there was a chip shop. And even right up to the day it closed, he had a coal-fired chip range. Portwood Bridge at the bottom of King Street East. This was the first road link between Portwood and the rest of the town long before the bridge that linked Great Port Street. The bridge was built in 1786. Here we can see the bridge with the cooling tower again evident in the background. Uh, Falder's Mill is there and on the right hand side we can see the main building and chimney of the power station. Now the bridge was built by James Harrison and he it was, he, he held the river rights from Denton to Tivitt Dale. So he was the one who introduced water power to enable most of the industrial development in Portwood. This is the Port Waterfall, or Weir, and this was built by James Harrison, which uh, enabled then a 12-foot drop from the sluice on the right-hand side of the top of the waterfall to feed Portwood Cut. And the cut provided the power to the new mills that were being built. Here's another picture of the waterfall looking down river and the right hand side, the point, you can see on the right hand side of the waterfall was the famous diving spot for all the fancy divers and swimmers that used to use the river there in the summer afternoons. Portwood Waterfall. Here's a view of Portwood Cut in a very sorry state. Looking down the cut you can see in the distance the new flats on Lancashire Hill. And of course there is the Meadow Mill. But this is the cut. It, was, it had been drained and it was just about to be filled in. Here the, the cut, forward cut again, looking in the other direction, up towards the waterfall end. All the concrete girders across the cut have been knocked down. Up on the right hand side is the old railway and part of that was being used at a tip by the time this photograph was taken. just 
come back to Portwood Bridge again, just over the bridge on the left stood Plant's Corn Mill. That was originally a cotton mill until 1843, and then it was a corn mill. And it stood between the junction of the two rivers. Now, in the basement of Plant's Mill, used to be the boxing arena or stadium called the Blood Tub, run by Joe Moran. Joe ran his fights in lots of places, including a stable in Backwater Street, uh, the first field going down to Portwood Weir, but his first real inside venue was the blood tub here in the basement of what was Plants Carmel. Now here's Joe and some of his fighters. Joe's in the middle there. It's not a very good picture, but he's got a leather boxing helmet on. That's what makes it look so funny. And of course, in the latter days, when he achieved semi professional status, he used to put fights on in the Mersey Stadium, which was a, a sports centre at the top of Eaton Lane, just behind Mersey Square. And by then, of course, he was quite respectable. As I say, there were some semi professional boats out there. I'm round the corner over the bridge now and we're having a look at Tiviotdale Station. And the station first opened in December 1865. There was a port station before that. It was a wooden platform affair, but it only lasted a couple of years. But that had run trains from Woodley to Woodley from 1863. Now the Tiviotdale Clocked up 100 years before it was finally closed. I think it was 1967 when the station closed. There's a look at number two platform, and you can see the wooden bridge which spanned the line. It came in the station on the left, and if you're traveling to the eastern side of the country, to Yorkshire district, you had to cross over the wooden bridge and get your train on this platform. Now in this shop, Platform 2 is virtually demolished and there are only goods trains using the station but you can see up on the right hand side you can just about see the roof of Pendlebury Hall. Here's the famous Tibbetdale West signal box. The back of the box overlooked the river and ground bottom. Now, the most famous passenger who ever arrived at the station, of course, was the Prince of Wales. He came to Stockport on the 7th of July 1908 to perform an official opening ceremony for the new town hall. And on the forecourt of the station, he inspected a guard of honor formed by the Stockport Volunteer Regiment. It's a very clear picture, but it is the building of the town hall. You can see the frantic work going on. This is the year before. It would be 1907, and the panic was on to get the town hall ready in time for the arrangements for the visit of the Prince of Wales.
just took a look at the station again, you can see the Hanover Chapel just over the rooftops of the station, that faced on to Lancaster Hill. The station finally closed down in 1967 and it was demolished the year afterwards. The railway bridge is spanned quite a few streets in Portwood and here's the bridge over Water Street. Just way up on the right is the Alligator Mill and the building jutting out on the left was the VI pub. Now just further than that and we can't get to it, it was the track works of Kent and Swarbricks. Here we are now, just a little bit nearer to the bridge, and you can just about well, you can see the the pub just past the cars part on the left, and the other side of that road. Then you can see a bit of the original building, which was the track works. Here's the B.I. pub. This is the B.I. then a few, a few years later on when I think it was part of an engineering works then. Part, part side engineering. But I can remember it as a very prosperous pub and it was a very famous venue for weddings at one time because it had a large function room upstairs. We're now looking up at the top end of of Brewery Street, just under the railway arch to the right, were the coal sidings where the wagons used to pick up the coal to feed the power station supply. But if behind us at the other end of Brewery Street, there was at one time actually a brewery. And the brewery would be at the Coal Park Mill end of the street. And it would be on the site, probably, to take on the government. where the Queen's pub is now on the river. And its entrance would be on Brewery Street, opposite the entrance to Crow Park. Mm -hmm. first bridge from the station was the old Portwood Place and this building was the mill owner's house for the Hope Mill and I think it finished its latter days as a blacksmith shop for a few years. Here then is, is Hope Mill, the back of Hope Mill, looking across, just about to see the, on the chimney, you can just about to see the rooftop of the alligator mill. And on the left here is the chimney of the mill. It finished up as a rubber works. Here we're looking down river towards the junction of the two rivers at Tibet Hill. We're looking down the river Tain. On the left is the back of Holt Mill. And on the right, it's overgrown here, but this was originally Grimes Bottom, the Grimes Bottom Recreation Ground. Here on Avenue Street is the Duke of Clarence pub. It was an old, it's an old pub, it was built in the early 1800s. Now, 
when it was being demolished in the 1970s to make room for the motorway complex, a skeleton was found in the bricked up part of the cellar. It was said to be one of the workers on the building of the railway who'd been knifed in a card game at the pub and hidden in the cellar. Most of the workers on the railway were immigrant workers, a lot of them Italian. So I suppose he wouldn't have been missed by any of his family and could have sat there in the brick up cellar for many, many years. Now we haven't got a photograph of the Queen's picture house on Avenue Street. Here is a little pencil sketch from memory that my my son did. The picture house called the Gem was built in 1912. It was refurbished in 1919 and called the Queen's, but everyone always referred to it as the Gem. Part of, the part of the original building was adapted afterwards for an engineering works, but the cinema itself was not converted to sound until 1932, and then for some reason it closed for two years and opened again in 1934. When it was a silent cinema, the piano player was a chap called Sammy Leeton, who lived in Queen Street near where I used to live. Yeah, the picture has finally closed in December 1940. And I think, if my memory is right, the last serial they were showing was the clutch in the hand. Now, just a bit further up Avenue you see, it was just past the picture house was Ellis Sykes Wholesale Warehouse. Now this, this building later was a, a day nursery du during the war, the end of the war, and then it became the headquarters of the St. John's Omelette Brigade in Stockport. Lots of ported girls learned basic nursing with the St. John's Omelette Brigade, but not many boys joined, because I think the uniform cost a lot much more than a hat and a woggle, which was all you needed in the scouts. Here are a few of the nurses from St. John Lambert's Brigade. Now we're on Great Port Street now, and there in the shade is the, the Old King pub on the corner of Lancaster Street. I think we've got a better picture of it somewhere else later on. There we are, just a little bit further up. The road and we can see Arthur Davis's shop on the corner of Lancaster Street. In the advert for a six penny block of chocolate. Don't know if that gives anybody an idea of a, a date. So down the next street now was Queen Street and on the corner of Queen Street and Brady Street was the, the Clifton Pub. Now the Clifton, like every other pub in Port, was, was famous for its 
trips out, usually a trip to Blackpool when everybody got dressed up in the best clothes. Don't think you can recognise anybody on the photograph. The chap in the middle of the picture in the, the light coat or smock was Bert Higginbotham, the plumber, and just below him on the front row was the landlady of the pub, Doris Rutter. in Queen Street. Now back at the top of Queen Street, on to Port, Port again, on the corner was PC Day's furniture store. That used to be a grocer's. I think it was George Mason, I'm not sure. And we can just about see in the distance St Paul's Church and the Spire. the picture was the Brinnington pub that was on the corner of Queen Street and Great Board Street and then this block of shop the middle shop was not all the the paper shop the news agents and next to him was a cobbler shop to do his shoe repairs and the building on the corner the first window there on the left was Mar Jennison's which was a Takeaway shop long before takeaway shops came out anywhere else. You could take a plate in there and she would put you a, a full dinner, takeaway dinner up. Or you could just have a pudding, take a base and another pudding, but that was my Jennison's takeaway shop. It's in more pictures, I think, than people are. Now we're looking down Brady Street, and the street that's crossing it, crossing it is Emperor Street. With the grand view again and the cooling tower, dominates Portwood, doesn't it? So the street going from right to left across Brady Street was Emperor Street. And here we are looking up Emperor Street now towards Portwood, Portwood Street, and the building on the right hand side at the top, you can just see the roof of the side wing of Portwood School. This is Emperor Street. You don't know that is outside on a box taking the sun. And we're at the bottom end of Brady Street now. The street that, that's going across the couple street is Swan Street and if, if we could have gone further back on our right we would have been on Swan Street Mission. The grocery shop with all the children outside is Clark's and to the left was the builder's yard of Higginbuck and the plumbers and beyond that was the bookie's yard of Johnny Chickero. But we're looking up Brady Street now. Just beyond the car that parked on the right, the building on the next corner was the Queen Caroline Public House. Here's, here's a much earlier picture of Great Board Street. You can tell that by the uh, single deck tram car. And the building on the right was the maintenance and engineering shop of the gas works. 
on the left are quite a number of shops. And, uh, I don't know if anybody can name any of them. But this is a rather early picture. One of the shops that did survive for quite a long time on Portwood was Howard's Bicycle Shop. And there's Mr. Howard himself at the doorway. Here now is a picture of the power station taken from the footbridge across Newbridge Lane with Palmer Mill on the right hand side there. And the power station was built in 1898. was built when the new extension was built in 1931 to the power station it meant cutting off part of the old fairground here's the cooling tower again but now it's on its, on its last leg definitely on its last leg because these were the shots when it was being blown up on the 23rd of August, 1981. There it is, on its way down. And there it was, disappearing in a cloud of dust. Here's an aerial view of the power station. It was a coal-fired station until 1963, when it changed over to oil to comply with the Clean Air Act. Now, the tram car system was supplied with power from the power station with two special generators, which were installed in 1901 to provide power for the trams. Now there were two, two pairs of gates to the fairground, cattle market. This is the one near to the gas work. The plaques that were on the pillars which told you all about the cattle market, they were removed and are stored in Topport Museum. So this is one of the later pictures of the gates on the railings, as you can see the coal is stored almost right up to the gates. Now this is the old tram depot on the corner of Eaton Lane. This was built on the site of what was formerly the original Stockport Gas Works. But we'll have a look at this and the trams because the trams ran in Stockport for near enough, exactly 50 years, from 1901 to 1951. And of course, one of the early routes was the one along Portwood. The early route to Woodley was along Princess Street and Lancashire Bridge and Portwood and to Vernon Park. There's an earlier Princess Street shot with the large building on the right hand side was Holland Drake's. Further along Princess Street, of course, the tram passed the, the picture house, as it was called, and then it was in the fancy name of the Palladium. Well, we didn't call it that until we started watching Sunday Night the Palladium on the telly because we always called it the Palladium. 
So it's hard to imagine now the actual bridge at Lancashire Bridge. But here we are with the Buck and Dog pub on the right and the actual bridge with the policeman on point duty. There's one of the old Green Linnet trams just turning into Lancashire Bridge on its way to Hyde. And behind it you can see a tram coming down from Redditch coming down Lancashire Hill. Here's a tram passing the Queen's on Portwood. To the left of the Queen's we can see Park Bridge and the corner of Alders Mill. On the corner now into Cunnington Road with St Paul's School on the left there. And there's a dog in the road there. There in the distance, you can see the only other public telephone box in Portwood on the corner of the churchyard. We did say we'd mention the telephone boxes again. And here we are on the route just opposite Vernon Park. Now this bit of the road was still officially in Uvis Lane as far as the bridge so you can settle an argument and people ask you, did trams ever run on every line? Yes, they did. The route along Portwood was from Edgeley. It started in 1914. It ran Edgeley to Hyde eventually. And this kept going until March 1947, when it was replaced by the number 30 bus, which went to Ashton, and of course the 74 bus, which went from Vernon Park back through Edgeley and all the way to Manchester. So here we are again, trams running on New Bridge Well, while we're here, we may as well nip into the park and have a look at what the park was like years ago. This is the lower walk with the fancy shelter that backed onto the end of Newbridge Lane. I can remember, remember open air concerts just outside this shelter with a bit of a wooden stage built around that huge tree in the centre there. Now the park opened in 1858. There was about 21 acres donated to the town by Lord Vernon, and the park was named after him. The land was originally Stringer's Fields. I think there's still a Stringer Street on Newby's Lane. Here we're looking across the lily pond, the ornamental lake. And at the back there, on the mound, we can see the aviary. Now the aviary was built from timbers which were saved when the curate's house was demolished on Churchgate. With the widening of Churchgate, it was a black and white timber frame building and some of the timber and the stonework was saved to build the aviary in the same style as the house here in Vernon Park. Now, the aviary was demolished in the 1940s for two reasons. One, it had been set on fire by the van by vandals, and secondly, it was not easy to replace any of the tropical birds or even to provide the right food for them during the war. Now we're at the top of the 
grand steps now looking down onto the park from the top of the steps. Either side of the steps there used to be two cannons which were saved from the Crimea War. And unfortunately I think these went for scrap in the Second World War. Just towards the higher centre of the picture you can see the roof of the aviary in this shop. Now we're a bit further up the hill now and having a look at the bandstand. The bandstand was very popular and it was the site of the annual music festival which was used to raise funds for the infirmary. The bandstand was built in 1888 and it lasted right until 1968 although it, there were very few events in the latter days. This was the July Music Festival event held every year to raise money for the Stockport Infirmary. Here's a poster advertising one of the open air music festivals at the park. This one was for July 1929. We're at the top of the park now, just on the corner outside the museum, looking back over the fields, and we can see, just see, on the right-hand side, the pear on the roof of Pear Mill, which quite a few people from Portwood went to work at Pear Mill. It was one of the newer mills, and it's still standing to this day now, Pear Mill, and is an industrial complex with one or two wholesalers in the place as well. Now, just on the right of the pitch at the bottom is the shrubbery round what was at first a duck pond and eventually became a sunken garden. There we go. There's a sunken garden and duck pond, lily pond, and on the left you can see the veranda of the museum which went down to the tea room. Now, behind is now was a little gate which was the entrance to Woodbank Park. But that was much too far for little lakes from Portwood. If you'd made it to the top of the hill in Vernon Park, you didn't have the energy to walk much further into Woodbank Park. And in any event, it seemed too remote from Portwood to Woodbank Park. Back down to Portwood again now, on the corner of St. Paul's School on, on Carrington Road, the tram lines have gone now, but some of the shops are still there, the phone box is still there, and the lollipop man who used to do the corner here was Tommy Allendale, who used to be also the steward at St. Joseph's Catholic Club. Just off Carrington Road and at the back of the church was the Portwood War Memorial, the white cross there, and the street at the side there was St. Paul Street, and this was where the carnival used to start off from. All the wagons used to assemble in St. Paul Street before they made their way down Portwood for the carnival parade. Now, there are a lot of pictures about the Stockport carnival, but this is the only one I could find. It was actually taken in Portwood. And this is a dancing troupe passing the gas works. It wasn't until I had a look at this that it reminded me that the tram line was set in huge black granite sets. And there we are. A rare picture of the carnival in Portwood. Here's St Paul's Church now 
and me the picture with the spire. The church opened in 1851 and closed in 1969 when the spire was taken down as it wasn't safe and the church was finally demolished in 19... Looking at St Paul's School and we can again see the church tower without the spire which was taken down in 1969. Now when I said about the two public telephone boxes in Portwood, there was another phone box and this was the police box on the corner of St Paul's School. It was a special box, there one or two around about the town and they were equipped as a first aid post as well and the little window frame at the left of the door there you could open that and pick up a phone and make a direct call to the police station without dialing a number i don't think anybody ever had the nerve to do it but that was the police box on the corner of st paul's school So there were two public car boxes and a police box in forward. Here are some children in the schoolyard, the St Paul's School, listening to the headmaster. I don't know the date of this. Was he Mr Simmons? Some people might remember the headmaster of St Paul's, Mr Simmons. Here's one St Paul's school class, I think this would be about 1949. It's hard to see on the uh, the board that the little has all done up in front, but I think it would be 1949. And just on the right hand side, top of the children's head, you can see the top of the police box that we were talking about earlier. Here marching up forward now are the St Paul's 12th Stockport Scout Group. I think the first scoutmaster was Alan Wagstaff. And the troop used to meet in St Paul's Place, two little houses, number one and number three, St Paul's Place, and they used to drill in the schoolyard. Now, one of the shops behind the boys as I walked along was the Brunswick Pie Shop. And this was run by a Mrs. Dewhurst, who got killed when she was electrocuted using one of the newfangled vacuum cleaners. I won't say that it put the sales of vacuum cleaners back in port, but because more people use a brush and shovel and a few tea leaves. Here we are, here are a few of the Portwood Scouts in the schoolyard and you can see quite clearly St Paul's Church behind there. Do you wonder if anybody can recognise themselves on this? So we're back on Cainton Road again. Have a look at the Vernon Cinema. Now the Vernon was opened in 1913 and it changed the sound in 1931. Now after the Sunday cinema started in 1945 it ran four changes of program each week. The prices were about half the price of the pictures in the town centre. And the double seats on the back row popular with courting couples. The Vernon ran, it, ran its last picture show in December of 1958. Here we are looking now at an aerial view of the gas works and you can see from this just how near the gas amateurs were to the river. The 
this is a late, later view of the gas road from the top of Avenue Street. The gas works first opened in November 1878. 78 replacing the one we talked about earlier on, Eaton Lane. It only had two small gasometers at first. Then the large green goddess was built in 1931. You can see that at the back of the buildings here, it was 255 foot high. The coal and coking plant was one of the largest in the north of England in its time. It was a massive, massive building. You didn't see most of this from the main road because you had the it's the small buildings on the office block in front of it. Here's a shot of the three gasometers looking down at Mersey Street and the mill on the left hand side there uh, in the corner is the Palmer Mill. Now the smaller gasometers were on a hydraulic principle and you see a, a different shading in colour on them now they could actually lower down into the ground and to, to the level of that marker the two of them but the large green one couldn't now across, across the other side of Portwood was the hay market and this was the depot where the gas board lorries were garage all the warehouses were there for spares and the gas fitters who used to do installations and repairs were based in this place plus an engineering repair workshop. I don't know how it got the name A Market at all, but just across the other side of Portwood, of course, there was a Hayfield Street. So whether originally the area did have anything to do with hay or the selling of hay, I don't know. This is the view of, of the gasometer again from the top of Alpine Road. As you can see, the right hand side of the giant gasometer, the small one has been submerged below ground there. And in the foreground of the picture is Vernon Park School. Vernon Park School in the snow, I think. Now, a lot of the people from primary school in Portwood then left and attended Vernon Park School. And in fact, even people from St. Joseph Catholic School used to come to half day sessions at Vernon Park, the girls to do cookery classes or domestic science, as it's called now, and the boys used to come to do woodwork classes at Vernon Park School. Now, during the, during the First World War, Vernon Park School was a military hospital, as were most of the council schools in the town. Now, here's a shot of Palmer Mill taken from Newby Lane. On the lower mill and chimney on the right are the Vernon Mill. Here's one of my photos of Palmer Mill taken from the top of Lancaster Street. This is when a lot of the property had been demolished. And there were one or two little warehouses and garages on the left. Now, here's a shot of Palmer Mill from Nibby's Lane. And you can see in the bottom right hand corner of the picture the footbridge which ran across from Nibby's Lane to Queen Street. There's the bridge again, it was a cast iron bridge and it was built in 1877 
to provide a shortcut for all the people working in the, in the mill instead of having to go all the way around to Andrew Square over in Park. Um, the bridge did in fact replace an earlier wooden bridge which was falling down. Here's the footbridge with the Vernon Mill in the background and the lower building in the background. The opposite side of Queen Street to Palmer Mill was in fact originally part of the Palmer Mill complex. Here's the footbridge again. This is in its uh, final days, I think. Captain's Bridge, it was called. And it did provide a wonderful shortcut from Movies Lane to Portland. Now we're looking at Meadowmill, which was built for T&J Lees in 1880. And it was unique in the one time it was both a cotton mill and a wool spinning mill. And when it was first built, it did take its water from Portwood Cut, which ran along the front of the mill. And the River Tame, of course, ran along the back. Here's a shot of the mill across at what used to be called the first field. We did talk about the first field and Joe Moran opened our boxing in this field years ago. This is a recent picture of the mill because you can see just over the, the roof at the left you can see the flats on Lancashire Hill. There's the lodge and the entrance for the mill at the top of Water Street. I think the building to the left of the lodge became the, the works canteen. But I'm not sure people have to tell you who worked at the mill. It did become an, and it's now an industrial estate with lots of different firms on different floors. You can see that by some of the signs here. And here are some ladies in the, the meadow mill. What are they doing? What are they doing? Coal mining? I think it is coal mining, yeah. Of course, the meadow mill was one of the largest employers imported at one time. Some more winders at the mill. You might even recognize these chaps. Here at the back of the Portwood Spinning Company complex is the, the last stretch of Portwood Cup before it is discharged back into the river. This is Portwood Old Hall, and the hall, this picture was taken in 1916, but the hall was the home of the Duckenfield family in the 1600s, when it was a half-timbered house. It was brick-clad in the 1700s, and in 1804 was the home of a chap called William Horrocks and his wife Mary. It was Horrocks who was the first one to install a steam engine in his mill in Portwood, and he patented an improved design for the power loom in 1802. The hall was bought by the Howard family in 1862, and it finished its days as uh, the Portwood Liberal Club. Here's 
Here is a shot of it in the distance from Portwood Hall Place. Uh, the centre part used to be a little uh, playground with swings and seesaws. And the inset picture was the storm roof cottages, which used to be to the left of, of the property. On your left now. Now, when the hall was demolished in 1969, it was just a slaughter job when the bulldozers moved in and they cleared the lot in two days and burnt all the timber and everything without any attempt to save anything at all. Here's a picture of some of the old timbers that were exposed during the demolition and they even exposed in the roof the original reed roof which had been slated over and I understand that even some of the reeds were still green but there was no attempt to save anything it was just all bulldozed down and burnt in a huge bonfire in a couple of days. So we're just having another look at the Queen's pub on Portwood, on Great Portwood Street. So that too was famous for its outings and its day trips to parts of field. And here it the gang all dressed up and somewhere to go for a day trip, posing for their photo outside of the Queen's. You probably recognise one or two people on the picture, but don't get excited if you do, because we don't pay royalties for anybody on these pictures. <laughs> the chap in the centre now, and here with me was Alfie Bergen, famous for tap dancing while he was sat down. on Longton Street now to have a look at the milkman. Pilkington, the local milkman, he used to deliver milk to all the houses in this side of Portwood. He didn't deliver bottles. He used to just measure the milk out with a can and people left the jug on the windowsill or the doorstep and he ladled it out into his jug. this lady is feeding the horse but you can see she's got clogs on and we're at the top of Great Bottle Street now looking up Brennington Rise the wall on the right is the wall of St Paul's Church must have been a quiet day there with the wagonette in the middle of the road, but uh, I think we'll have a look up Bridlington while we're here because Portwood was once part of Bridlington Township, believe it or not. Bridlington is an older place than Portwood. Now, these houses on the bend of Bridlington Road were demolished to make way for the new motorway. the left of these, of course, were the allotments. Now up on the top of Brillington Rise was Brillington Hall. It must have been a wonderful building. It was demolished about 1930, but the, the outside wall, the Greystone Wall, is still on the, on the edge of Brillington Road. Now the lodge to the hall, Billington Lodge, stayed standing right until the building work started on the, Sim the new St Paul's Primary School. And the school stands right on the site of where the lodge was. Now the hall itself must have hosted lots of local events and this is a picture from Stockport Library calendar showing you amateur theatricals in the hall in the late 1800s, about 1892 I think. Now 
not a very good picture this, but this was the house on on the bend of the road, just past the hall, and it was the home of George Wally, the wholesale grocers. Uh, it stands, the site now is the Jack and Jill pub, and behind the house were some lovely gardens and an orchard, and this is the site now, covered by St Bernadette's Church. Just further up the hill on Brinton and to the left beyond the new shops was Maycroft. And this is Maycroft Farm. This stood about where? There's still a place called Maycroft and the place Keston Crescent. But this was about the area where Maycroft Farm was. And further up now and we're looking at the old farmer's arms. This was decorated, I think, for the coronation. The old farmer's arm stayed open right until the day that the new pub built behind it was opened. And on the opening day of the new pub, the demolition men moved in to knock down the old farmer's arms. Now here we are, just further up Brinton Road and under the railway bridge, we were on Lingard Lane. And this is the old Bradbury Pit. There were about five pits in the area at one time between Brillington Moor and Bent's Lane. But they were all small places, they only employing eight to nine people. This was about the biggest pit in the area. And you can see there were two shafts and this employed quite a few port people as well. I can remember people uh, coming home from the shifts and jumping off the back of a lorry in Portwood. There used to be a lorry that used to pick everybody up and drop them off in Portwood. Here's a view of Portwood with the cooling tower and the gasometer and Falder's Mill. I think this must have been taken from the platform of the railway station but it's not a very clear picture. Here you can see the gasometer at the top right and the view over Portwood. I think this must be taken from the top of Pendlebury Hall because we're looking in the, the centre foreground of the picture there's the Hanover Chapel on Lancashire Hill but you can see the mill complex either side of, of the railway line in Portwood. Back to a rather grand uh, view, looking down Brady Street, again of the cooling tower. And this was said, I never tried it, but he said if you stood in the right place on Brady Street at the right time in the evening, you could actually see the sunset down inside the cooling tower. Here's a reasonably recent picture of the Brinnington Inn, which was at the corner of Queen Street. It's still there now, and it's still thriving. So here's a, one of my recent pictures of the old king. It was opened in 1826, and it was called the George the Fourth. But after George V was crowned, it was referred to as the Old King, and everybody called it that. And then when it was refurbished, it was even given the name over the door, the Old King. And there is the coach and horses at the bottom of Queen Street. This is still standing and still thriving, I believe. The coach and horses. It's hard to believe that in 1820, Port only had one pub, it had one pub called the Millstone, but I don't know where it was. No, there were no supermarkets in Portwood, but we did have on the corner of Garfield Street, Portwood, Co-op, and the Co-op main shops were in the 
the street there and to the left of the corner on the front was the butcher's department. The first crop importer was in 1828 but it didn't last long, it was a small venture and it died a death and then the new co-op was revived in the 1860s. So it was quite an early cooperative. Here's a shot of the Vernon Mill on Mersey Street. Now the, the first Vernon Mill was built in 1880. But it was destroyed by fire. Now when the first mill was destroyed by fire, that was on the 5th of November 1902. What a bum fire night that was. And nine people lost their lives in the fire. But the new mill was built and up and running and get running in just over a year. Here's a shot of the mill from Newbies Lane and you can see the engine room and the bar of that at the side of the chimney there. I'm during the war. I'm trying to give you your bear, some bearings on this. There is the Palmer Mill with the footbridge over to Newbies Lane. This is Queen Street, then Great Port Street, and Marsden Street, Richard Street, and you can see the clearing in the area there, and that must have been cleared away after the bomb had dropped. the bomb damage in uh, looking up Marsden Street. Two people were killed when the bomb dropped here and this is Redfern and the Mr. Cunliffe. We're looking up to the news agent shop at the top of the street on Great Port Street and here's another shot of the bomb damage. This must have been the very next morning. It would be the 3rd of December 1940 and there's still a lot of people there trying to get a view of the damage but being held back on the corner there. Some people say that they slept through the air raid but some people dashed off and were safely tucked up in the tunnel, the shelters on the rock hole, the sandstone shelters, which weren't very comfortable at all. So after the war we had the VE Day parties, this one I think would be on uh, Water Street, might find someone in this one you recognise. Blackwater Street and uh, recognise quite a few people on this picture. We'll have a little zoom in in a minute. And this party was in Queen Street on the corner just outside the Clifton.
most of the lads in the army, Port Woodward and the Cheshire Regiment, or the, the Pioneer Corps. Here's some of the lads in the Cheshire Regiment. Now, just beyond the part where the bomb dropped in Port Wood was the yard of Henry's Mill, just behind the bomb site there off Marsden Street. And I put this picture in it because it shows the, the round tower and staircase to the mill. It's unusual in that most of the mills had a square tower and a square staircase, but this was built with a round tower and this was Henry's Mill. Back on Port now, I'm going to look at the Brunswick Chapel. Uh, the first street beyond that was Thames Street going down to Portwood Cup. Now the chap the Brunswick Chapel opened in 1848 and one special feature in later years was that in the basement of the chapel was a, one of the first child welfare clinics in the town with the entrance off Brunswick Terrace. Now, the, the Roman Catholics in Port would have to attend the St. Michael's Mission Chapel, which was on Park Street. And the chapel opened in 1851. It would be on the site of what was later Bennett's Wholesale Grocers and somewhere now under where Asda is. Now, this picture was out of the Illustrated London News when the Irish riots were on in 1852 and the chapel was virtually wrecked but it was repaired and it stayed open until the St. Joseph Church was opened in 1862. Now the priest for St. Michael's mission lived in a little house in Mersey Street. And one of my later pictures of St. Joseph Church looking up Tatton Street. And the side door of the church, which I think had a rather fine window, and it seems to go unnoticed by most people. Now, as well as St. Joseph's School, there was the Bishop Brown Memorial School, which had its entrance off High Street in Stockport, and uh, there were two large buildings. Uh, I think the glass walkway went between the boys' school and the uh, the property, which was the living quarters of the nuns. In later years, the, the large building here on the left and centre of Betcha became the headquarters for the girls' club of St. Joseph's. And there's a, here's a shot of the industrial school classroom, and this became uh, part of the boys', boys club. The, the upstairs part of this building was similar with a stage at one end, and that was the chapel, the nun's chapel for the school. Well, we packed away, it all started, what I think is a beautiful bridge, Portwood Bridge, from the one of the colour photos I a couple of years ago. Uh, we've gone on a little bit longer than I originally intended, but I hope you've all enjoyed this and really we could maybe sometime do a volume two. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks for listening and watching.